Welcome to Marvel Vision, a podcast about Marvel, the MCU, and right now, Phase 2. I'm Alex. Yes, I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite MCU movie, Thor The Dark World, the 2013 sequel to the first movie, which was called Thor Not The Dark World, just in case Mm. you were wondering. So this was released November 8th, 2013, directed by Alan Taylor, screenplay by Christopher Yost, Christopher Marcus, and Stephen McFeely, based on a story by Don Payne and Robert Rodat. Now, first of all, you probably Rodat seen... was on this? Rodat! Nice. He wrote Rodat. that. Rodat. Rodat. Ice. He, ro- he wrote that. He wrote <laughs> that. Rodat, Rodat. Now, you've probably seen this movie a couple of times, I'm sure, as oh, you made yeah. your way through the MCU, so mm. you're familiar with it. But if not, go watch it. Have a good time. It's one of the shortest movies in the MCU, so it's not going to take you too long to check it, it out and watch. And you're meant to you're meant to watch it every night, right? It's when dark mm-hmm. when the darkness falls, we enter the dark world. Exactly. Yeah. That's how the I do it. Upside down. My kids can't go to sleep until they watch Thor the Dark World in its entirety. Yes, they love Malekith. <laughs> well, let's talk about this movie and let's specifically talk about watching this movie again because all I mean, not joking aside, but like this is when people rank the MCU, this routinely ends up at the bottom. There's a little wiggle room there. There's some other movies that people rank lower than that. Yes. But this is certainly the one that I would say most frequently is a butt for jokes of the MCU. It's the one that people hate the most. What do you think? What was your take when you first saw it? And what was your take checking back in with it now? Well, before we go into what our takes Ooh, were, I do okay. think we should establish that, yes, many consider it a lower tier movie. But one of us on this panel here... Considers it top tier. Really? Isn't that you? No. I thought you liked this. Thor the Dark World? No, I love yeah. Thor. The first world. The Oh, Thor, not the Dark World. No, not the Dark World. So you're saying I, this uh, is the bottom. I feel like I've, you've gone to bat for this movie in the past. Well, so I may have. That's possible. I don't necessarily mm-hmm. remember that, but it definitely sounds like the sort of thing that I would probably do. Yeah, you stinker. I mean, in general, my the line that I use all the time, which I still think is true, is like, MCU movies are watchable pretty much no matter what. Like, even when you're talking about a pretty bad MCU movie, it's not something like, oh my God, this is garbage. I'm going to turn this off in the middle. I feel physical pain watching this. Most of the time, they're like, C plus or above, you know, which is still, yeah, that's Mm. fine. I can put that on. I check that out. And even this one, frankly, and maybe this does make me the apologist here. I'm curious to hear what you guys think. This is fine. Like it's, it's not good. And it definitely got worse over time. And there's a lot of things that I think will be interesting to dive in and talk about, particularly given how we have been rewatching and talking about Phase one and the way we talked about Iron Man three last week with Adam Pally. I think some of the themes oh, and great weaknesses, up. great up themes and weaknesses of the MCU definitely rear their head here again that we can talk about. But it's still like watching the movie. You know the performers are good. It's fine. Some of the action is pretty good. I, I didn't have a problem watching it. I, I'm I, excited actually. Sorry to cut you off, Pete. Um, uh, but I'm excited that we have um, the Aether here as our guest. Um, just the uh, that blood mist is just spinning all around us. Real uh, quick, favorite cloud villains in comic book movies. Okay, uh, what got, do you think? Well, you got you got Galactus. You got Hulk. Yep. You got uh, this Aether. Yep. Um, Loki, just regular cl- Eliath, right? I'd put uh, you, Eliath number one. Easily. No, just don't knock out regular clouds that ruin a lot of sunny beach days for. Oh, do we yeah. do we include Parallax from the Green Lantern movie? He has a face, but he's also a cloud. Here's my theory that I've published a lot. This mm-hmm. is all one cloud, man. It's all oh, one fucking what? cloud. <laughs> Look around, see it's it. It's all in the cloud, man. <laughs> it's the cloud. <laughs> all these clouds are the cloud. I got my photos went. I gotta say, rewatching this because my original watching it, I was like, "Oh, I don't like this movie. This isn't <laughs> enjoyable." But watching it now, uh, because of like the other shows, it was great seeing Cat again. Like uh, I was like, "Oh, excited you love about!" Her. You I thought love that that her. was a fun addition to this. Um, yeah, it's a little. Also, the Rock Monster was like, "Oh, that's kind of like Korg." 
There was like a little Korg shout out that's coming Angry later. Korg. Korg gets wrecked in this. Yeah. yeah. Well, Eat this Korg. is just to give a little bit of context there for those of you that don't know the comics. This race is called the Cronins, and they first showed up in the very first appearance of Thor in Journey into Mystery number 83. So that's the race going on here. And then, of course, I think like a lot of things, they improved the take on that when they got to Thor Ragnarok and introduced Korg, which is a well, much funnier, much more. Well, funny since character. we are talking about movies, though, instead of comic oh, books, I okay. would like to say that uh, I would think <laughs> the rock monster uh, from Never Ending Story mm -hmm. is probably more uh, close to relation to. I think uh, that's a much uh, okay. more salient and useful point, Pete. Yeah, Thank you yeah. for making it. Yeah, real These quick. These look rank... like strong hands. Rank rock monsters from movies. I'm gonna put The Rock from Fast Five, probably number one. Like he is a, he is a straight up fucking yeah, monster. Is, you you cannot, yeah, oh he's fully stunned. He runs the rock. through a wall. It's he's wild. cut. He's fully cut. He's definitely serious Korg. Um, so this is interesting so far. It sounds like my estimation of this movie may have gone down since I first watched it. Pete's estimation has gone up. Justin, what wow. about you? It all yeah. comes down to uh, you. Interesting. Do I choose a side? Well, let me say two things first. Um, one, this movie falls into a very distinct time period where Chris O'Dowd was like the dude to go to. <laughs> Real Chris O'Dowd phase of our culture. Um, so yep. weird to see him there um, playing. Uh, he's sort of this generation's Bill Pullman. And I'm sorry to both of them to make that comparison. Oh, man. Oh, geez. Come on. Uh, Isn't oh, he? Well, that's There's not that mean. This is... <laughs> Absolutely terrible, but there's some show on, I think, like Sundance Now or something that's 10 minutes long, and it's about him and a woman, I'm forgetting who it is, who are going through a breakup. It might even be called The Breakup or something like that, and it's very good. So really? you're absolutely right. He was definitely like one of those UK comics that people picked on and said, he's going to be a big star. Put him in every movie. He's going to be the comic relief in Thor in the Dark World. It didn't quite work out, but mm -hmm. he's made a good career for himself anyway in the long term. Um, and then my second point, um, this movie is the quantum of solace to uh, Thor. Mm, wow. It is like a haste, it feels like a hastily made movie where they didn't put in a lot of stakes or interesting characters. Character no, they put like, stakes. That's key. There was giant stakes in this movie. Were, <laughs> metal <laughs> stakes. <laughs> and they needed a hammer to drive mm -hmm. those stakes in. They I mean, beat Malekith with stakes. Yeah, yeah this absolutely was right. all stakes. I would, that that I sounds disagree. like they misinterpreted the um, studio note. <laughs> like, we need this needs more stakes. They were like, all got right. it. <laughs> got it. Done. Um, that's very funny. I think um, they no no great character moments outside of a couple for Loki, really, which we end up seeing in the Loki series. The only the only valuable moments, I feel mm -hmm. like, it was just like plot rush through and get as much story and plot like cranked through in this short run movie. Um, so I, I don't know. It definitely feels like a forgettable movie. I feel like my opinion has maintained. I'm right in the middle. It's just like fine Classic and Justin. fine. So it's interesting that you mention the rushing to get the movie done, because I do think that without having been involved in the production process, obviously, but that seems to be pretty clearly the issue with this movie. Originally, they wanted to get Kenneth Branagh back to direct this movie again, which I think nothing against Alan Taylor, who I'm sure is a very pleasant guy, but this has does not have the visual flair of the first movie, which is something that I think whatever you think about the first Thor Kenneth brought a ele <clears throat> elevates it in terms of the yeah, direction. Alex is he crying. <clears throat> uh, are you okay, he dude? I'm getting really Thor. choked up when I think about uh, the first Thor, the movie that we all unilaterally agree is the best movie in the MCU. Nope. No, not. Oh, all right. Okay. We can discuss that uh, off air, I guess, or I could edit this part out. But <laughs> Kenneth Branagh, regardless, gives a visual flair to it that Alan Taylor does not. He didn't want to come back because this was they set a date for it. They were like, it's coming out on this date. This is what is coming out. And he was like, I don't have enough time to do that. Thanks I so much. I don't work that way. <laughs> You'll have to wait until I am ready to direct this. Well, Get but to there. that point, beyond the visual flair... There's also like the thing that actually very surprisingly worked, and maybe we debated this a little bit, but I think about the first Thor is he straddled that superhero Shakespeare line the way that he wanted to more often than not, and it does not work here at all. 
you know, without Kenneth Branagh, somebody who actually understands that, they went to this guy named Brian Kirk, who had directed on Game of Thrones. He dropped out pretty quickly. Then they went to Patty Jenkins, who went mm-hmm. on to direct Wonder Woman, of course, to huge success. Uh, and they didn't want to go with her vision of the movie. Like, she specifically left on reportedly good terms, but for creative differences, where she had a very different idea of the movie. She wanted to make it sort of this Romeo and Juliet thing where mm-hmm. Thor and Jane wanted to be together. Odin didn't want it. And because they escaped to Earth, they accidentally released Malekith. And there's this whole plot there. So that it has consequences in terms of their romance. Um, stakes. Yeah, stakes. There you go. Instead giant of the stakes, stakes, giant stakes that they used. But she left because of that. And then they ended up bringing Alan Taylor, who was a, a well-regarded director on Game of Thrones. But that is a TV show that had set its own visual flair. And this is definitely reading behind the line, between the lines, because nobody has really come out and said this. But it really seems like in terms of production, in terms of post-production, this movie was a disaster. Nobody had a good time doing this movie. Mm. Everything was rushed. It seems like this was a, a director and a staff and everybody who didn't know what they were doing, a studio that was too tentative about things. Alan Taylor was upset about it because they changed so many things in post-production. The script changes, changed, as you saw. They brought on... Uh, Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, who are writing uh, Winter Soldier, which we'll talk about next week. Great movie. Mm. Uh, but they brought him them on Take to fix it. Easy. it. Save some for the next Well, uh, but I think, like, they brought them on to fix it. Uh, there's this very famous story about Joss Whedon basically being, like, airlifted onto set to rewrite some scenes on the fly and, like, literally getting back onto the plane and still rewriting scenes and adding to them and Alan Taylor being like, oh, thank you so much. So it sounds like... This was all over the place, and it really, to the point that you're making, Justin, I know I belabored that, but to your point, it, sure. it shows on screen there's too many things that are happening in too many sections. Well, it feels like a TV show. Like, we mm-hmm. don't inter- reintroduce the characters really well. It's like, you know who this is, so let's just keep going, let's keep going, and it's it the pace of it, it moves very quickly. Yeah. Which I think is nice. It's not a bad thing, necessarily, but we don't ever get to stop and really sit in moments. Um, mm-hmm. Well... Except for when a performer like Loki really... They pull like pulls the moment to him and holds. Or on. when Thor takes his shirt off and then looks into the stars of the night. Well, let me say that scene. I also noticed um, Odin was like, "Humans are stupid. You yeah. need to stay here and wash your muscles in a standing <laughs> towel bath." Yeah, uh, I believe. I believe if I have my order right, and this is the only line that I wrote down for the movie, Odin says. You must think I'm a piece of bread to be buttered so heavily. Yeah, he did say that. Oh, man, I love well-buttered yeah. bread. That's Toast? straight out of, what was it, Macbeth, I believe they pulled it out yes. of? Yes. Yeah. You call me Toast, <laughs> Macduff? And I felt... yet you slather me with jams, jellies, bread <laughs> butters? I think not. And then he kills him. Wow. I felt so bad for Anthony Hopkins at that moment. It... His reaction after about? saying that lie was just like, oh. It, I like that line because it's, you know, Thor is being too complimentary to him. Mm-hmm. And no, I like, know what the oh. line means. Well, then don't. <laughs> then what the fuck are you talking about? It's a bad line. This is what I'm talking about with the faux Shakespearean stuff where it's just like, it feels so false. Except for when, like you're saying, Justin, Loki and Thor interact. That's... That's an hour in, and that's when the movie pops. Like, that's the oh that's the God. part of it that really works. You take me to be some fruity pebble to be milked <laughs> upon and shoveled into your mouth uh, while you watch a Saturday morning cartoon? That is not even a thing anymore. I, I very feel like I have been shot with cause, the silver bullet. <laughs> it's a right beer now. Mm-hmm. Come on, man. Well, Pete, uh, so Jane, I, I do think the I'm Jane curious. awkward date was was very magical, and that happened earlier. All right, but for, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's first start at the start of the movie. Oh, okay, Jesus the Christ. Marvel flip was a comic, oh and it was glorious, and it should you should pay homage to the reason that you're there. You should pay respect to the comics and promote the comics because that's the only reason this is happening. Pete, you're like a color commentator at an NBA game who keeps going back to, like, you know what we need? 
Peach baskets instead of hoops. What are we doing with these hoops? <laughs> Nets? The game is about peach baskets. I mean, we got some fun Thor with the hammer flexing his powers a little bit at the beginning. We got that fun Korg moment, and then he like does a spin move with the hammer. He's like, anyone else? Oh, come on, this is fun action line stuff. I... I do think there's fun moments in here. The main thing, and I know this is ridiculous, but the main thing I remember out of Thor The Dark World, which I still think works as a moment, is Thor hanging up his hammer on the coat rack. Yeah, that funny. was hysterical. That's a funny yeah. joke. Uh, in a very aggravating way, that was something that was improvised by Chris Hemsworth while he was playing around with the hammer on set, which... Very much side note, but in uh, the uh, Ghostbusters with Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig, one of my favorite movie scenes of all time, the My Cat scene, the My Cat scene mm -hmm. where he's interviewing with them, is all improvised by Chris Hemsworth. And I think that's the thing, again, with the Loki stuff that like really works here is when you get Chris Hemsworth's charm out when he's working yeah. off of somebody or something, like whether it's him doing a funny moment like the hammer or when he's stammering to Jane if, at certain if points. If only he had John Favreau to work with, you know, it would have been... Well, or well, Kenneth Branagh. Hammer. Like, I think Kenneth Branagh got the humor out of him in the Earthbound scenes in particular. And this just is too serious across the board, Very particularly when a lot of the stuff is dumb sci-fi nonsense. And I say that as somebody on a Marvel podcast. Mm -hmm. I wish we just got a scene where we saw... Uh, Chris Hemsworth just like washing his sense of humor with like a wet mm. towel, oh, just yeah. really like scrubbing it down slowly while uh, he looked also out at like, the stars. Idris Elba got some kind of like action uh, moments. It was very small, but he took down a ship all by himself with like there's a couple clearly, knives. Well, there's clearly an attempt to right some of the wrongs from the first movie. To your point. There's the Idris Elba action moment. Renee Russo gets a little more to do, even though she yeah. dies, but at least she is the oh, spoiler. emotional uh, fulcrum of the movie in a certain way, at least when it comes to Thor and Loki. And clearly that's paid a lot of dividends down the road, both with Avengers Endgame and also with Loki the series as well. That's powered a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like little bits, I think. They could have done more. Yeah, um, and it, both of those moments actually felt tacked on and not really necessary for the plot. The plot, the, the moment there with um, with Frigga when she is killed, it's really Loki's to blame. He's the one that tells the guy to go up the staircase to, oh, to was find awful. her. Yeah, but that moment is is really well done. It's very like Spider Man, um, Spider Man origin. Uh, yeah, moment. helping the guy with the yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's well, so and for those of you who haven't read the comics, what happens in the comics is Spider-Man starts out as a wrestler. He is in the hallway. A robber runs by, and Spider-Man looks at the robber and is like, "Hey, my uncle Ben's down the hallway." To the no, oh, <laughs> go fuck yourself! Go <laughs> fuck exactly. yourself for saying that out loud. Well, because loud. Uncle Ben was like a little bit of an asshole to him earlier, oh, and he was like, yeah. "Don't you go out?" And he was like, "Fuck." No, that he guy. was. Oh, come on, shoot him. Um, that awful zone. But that moment, while I thought it was a very cool, almost Shakespearean moment, you could mm -hmm. say, and it's so unregarded in the plot. Like, Loki in the story never really finds out that he does that, that he caused that. And yeah. it's like, it's just like, well done, but like, highlight that a little bit. Well, I think this comes into another thing, and there's been various reports that I, I read before we we're doing the podcast. So there's some uh, potentially conflicting information here. I don't know how much this was, but initially. They were kind of planning on this as like, uh, and we've talked about this a bunch on the podcast before. They didn't know what they had in Loki. So they were looking at this as like, okay, this is the end of Loki's arc. We're going to uh, kill off Loki here. And the scene where he dies in the movie is supposed to be where he dies. Apparently they did test screenings with it and people were like, fuck you. No, yeah. we love yeah. this guy. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. They were very surprised by it. Went back, shot a bunch of actual scenes like not just cut-ins not just reaction shots but full-on scenes particularly with loki to flesh out his part bring him back to life add things in with him add an emotional arc so that might be part of the reason that you don't get that stuff there is they were working off of what existed and then just adding more loki material to flesh it out a little bit more and it's also yeah. fun we're coming off the loki series like just to see him on screen uh it's like oh man loki you've been through so much man yeah, but that, that Loki, that's a different Loki. Right, but 
still, it's kind of it's fun to watch Loki and then see him now a little bit. And yeah, but that's the he's... correct Loki. The one that you love from the series is variant Loki. They're different Lokis. They're different characters. Entirely different. Characters. Yeah, you have to like them differently. There's uh, an infinite number of Lokis, I'm sure. Uh, you know, but uh, don't tell me what one I have to like or not like because. Uh, alligator Loki is my favorite Loki of all time. So hmm. nice of all time, uh, yeah. based on his emotional arcs and the amount of times that we've seen him. Yeah, and the, yeah. how we'll see him going forward. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the big thing that I wanted to mention, just based on what we were talking about with Iron Man three in particular, and I think this is the overall thing that really brings down Thor: The Dark World is that it plays it too safe. And I know that's crazy sounding for mm, something where like, they destroy London and whatever. But the thing that really grated on me this time while I was watching it through was it felt like they took that phrase from the first movie, which is so smart in the first movie where he says, what you see as magic, I see as science. And they were like, oh, okay, so they're aliens. And we're going to work off of that because there was this first alien invasion of New York and Avengers. So let's expand on that. What if there were other alien invasions elsewhere in the world, this time in London? So they have all of the Asgardians and everybody using guns and cannons and grenades and flying spaceships and trying to make it like Star Wars instead of fantasy world. And it's it's a bummer. Like, I, I wish they would lead more into the Asgard of it rather than make it feel more realistic. And to me, that feels like trying to make it acceptable for audiences, trying to work off what they already have instead of expanding further. Uh, anyway, you can say Asgard instead of Asgard. Because it's kind of dry. As, asshole guard. How about that? Oh, oh, great, great. <laughs> it's short. For, that's what mm -hmm. it's short for. Um, I think it's, it's funny you say Star Wars because this, this uh, movie reminds me of the more recent Star Trek movies mm -hmm. where it is like sort of, Lots of glitz and glamour, but at the end, it's like, wait, what's happening? And it's um, a lot of plot, but not a lot of like, hey, actually, here's the, the story we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I agree with you that it definitely has that sort of sci-fi element. Um, the, the Dark Elves are very like Chitari or like random Star Trek movie villain where they're just like sort of big and mean and have like uh, scary faces, but there's no really other differentiating uh, quality there. Even Malekith, who's such a big villain, especially yeah. in the most more recent run on uh, the Thor comic book, um, who is this like horrible, like almost Joker esque uh, character, like sadistic. He's just sort of like, nah, I want this thing. It's such a waste. It's such a waste, yeah. not just of the character Malekith, but also Chris Eccleston, who is a great actor, and you can see barely wants to be here in this movie. Apparently, oh, at some points in the that. draft, there were. Uh, backstory there was a whole thing about like his wife and kids die and he wants revenge right. on it asshole guard because of that is that pronounced right Pete? <laughs> yep okay Checks out to me great uh but they cut all of that out and he was apparently very frustrated about it also apparently they were going to cast mads michelson first mm. and then later on he went on to be a very generic villain in dr strange instead so everything worked out for him congrats to him um pete uh, as the darcy head here Mm -hmm. What did you think of Ian, her intern? Uh, well, it was fun. And what I did mean, you think about the fact that she sexually assaulted and harassed her uh, employee, her subordinate? Go ahead. Well, I hope that's uh, not the case. Um, that's her but, intern. Yeah, it is. It, it, you know, But he did pick up a car and save her life. I think the emotions were high. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd like to get, kind of get back to where I wanted to start was the awkward date, uh, was really just fantastic. Seeing Jane, Justin just straight up was a, like, a, a oh, here's up. the volleyball, hit it. And you're like, I'm actually playing <laughs> no. golf right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the way that she kind of like holds a menu is just so adorable and her frustrations. And then the sea bass moment was great. I mean, you you guys talk about didn't have powerful moments. Uh, that whole sea bass line was really just... I wouldn't call that a powerful moment. But yeah. that does bring up a topic I do want to discuss. Um, given Love and Thunder is sort of our next dip into the Thor world, dip, what do dip. we think of Jane Foster um, as a character here? Uh... So I remember being very struck 
that's probably too strong, but I liked the first time through when I saw it that they had bumped her up in terms of actually using science to do stuff, even if it's sci-fi silliness where she's creating portals and throwing people through and it's essentially the end of Monsters, Inc., except with Thor and Jane, you know? Um, nice. But but it's like, it feels a little weak now, particularly with other things that have happened in the MCU and other more complex characters rather than science lady doing science stuff, you know? But Natalie Portman is great. And I mean, we could definitely get into this more on the vision board thing, but I think with the right director and with the right material, she'll be really good. Yeah, I mean, the comics are great. What they do um, in with uh, Jane Foster in the comics is amazing. So it would be nice to see uh, what how that's going to be done. Um, but yeah, I, I, I disagree a little bit with how hard you were on the uh, science kind of stuff. But I just, I'm anti-science in general, but go ahead, Pete. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I thought it was fun when they were playing with the portals and they were like, oh, get the guy with the big sword. And then uh, Kat. All I mean of... about it is it very similarly to how we were talking about the Black Widow moments in Iron Man 2 back on the Phase 1 podcast, where when it came out, it felt like, yes, girl power fighting moments. And in retrospect, it's like, oh, no, that's not actually what that was at all. It's a very proto version of it. Here. I love the fact that they pushed her forward. The portal fights are actually a lot of fun to watch, I think, just as a final fight. Certainly more fun than watching Thor go through a cloud and cut a guy's arms off, you know? But <laughs> but it's not quite as strong on the, yes, this is a real STEM moment as maybe I thought back I, in 2004. I, but, I, I, but what about the part where, it's, uh, you know, Jane's like, Darcy, because she's kissing the intern, and she's like Jane, and then the hammer flies by, and she's like Mew Mew. I mean, come yeah. on. I mean, Mew that Mew was just. Fun. And then Jane says, "Hey, this is an HR nightmare waiting to happen right here." <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is crazy they made that case, and there's Eric Selvig with no pants for most of the. Oh, movie. the whole no pantsing was driving me crazy. You think Stellan was on. like? You think Stellan was like? Oh, I can't wait to play this character again. <laughs> where I'm pantsless, a raving pantsless man for this whole <laughs> So comfortable. Um, but, but in uh, Stellan Skarsgård, I was reading an interview with him, his main issue with Avengers was he wasn't comfortable enough, and he was like, can yeah. I take my pants off and yeah. just chill? They were like, you just a, wait. <laughs> Prank. I, mean, I You know, Thor was nice enough to hug, to hug him without pants on. I thought that was a real nice you can say thing hug to him. Thor. He what? was nice enough to hug him. That's the sign for that. When you hug Don't a pantsless, give me look, shit about mispronouncing words. I'm not no, giving you, no, mispro- no, 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 no. Not giving you no, shit about it. I when you mis- hug somebody that has no pants on, but you have pants on, that's called hogging them. It's yeah. hogging them. That's yeah. the slang. I'm always leaning in for a hog. <laughs> that's what I say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I uh, back on the Can't the wait Jane until Foster. COVID stops and I can get a couple more sweet hogs in. Yeah. We exclusively hog. <laughs> three uh, of us, yeah. Three of us. I on the Jane Foster thing. I, I agree with you. It was crazy. She was like the most powerful character for a large portion of this movie. Yet she couldn't access the power. She was ended up just being the object that these two like men were chasing. Huge missed opportunity. I feel like to actually have her play a role here, and I think it would have been more interesting if, while she is so science focused and has this power, if she's like wielding this magical weapon but trying to talk about the science of it while she's just wrecking shop that would have been awesome apparently there was a plan to do that at one point i think it was just script stuff and it didn't really get close but they had a version where jane went kind of nuts with the ether power and i think I think was the reason that Malachus Homeworld was destroyed, like directly attacked it. Mm. But then they felt like, no, this is too many villains. It's distracting. Let's all focus it on Malekith instead. But I agree. It also points to something that we've talked about all along in these early podcasts in terms of Marvel kind of winging it in terms of the Infinity Stones, where it's <sighs> like... <laughs> This is yeah. this is barely even a stone. Like, at one point, early on, it's a stone. Mostly, it's goop. You know? Oh, it was blood mist. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that that... I had forgotten the in the post credit scene that they, like, collected it and it became the, a stone. I was like, oh, wow. That is not at all at play in this movie. And which stone? That's the reality stone? 
Is that what no, it is? It's um, the Crystal uh, Bloodstone, isn't it? The Crystal Bloodstone, yeah. No, it's the Power Stone, I believe. No, uh, the Power Stone is the Purple Stone, right? Which they deal with in Guardians of the Galaxy. Hold on, I'm going to look this up. We should really do this. Red uh, beforehand. Stone, Infinity Stone. The... Uh, but yeah, it's the way. Reality Stone. That's what it is. Which, again, like getting back to like the winging it nature of things... That has nothing to do with anything in this movie whatsoever. They clearly wrote this movie and they're like, oh, we should make it an Infinity Stone. Mentioned stones a couple of times. Let's go. Or they were just like, let's make this movie. And at the end, they were like, can we make that an Infinity Stone? Mm-hmm. And just um, slot it in, give it to the collector for some reason. Which, sure. feels like which also doesn't movie. pan out at all because no. he doesn't do anything with it. No. Especially with the, at the threatening end, um, we're uh, one down. Um, uh, six to go five to go um and it's like what you don't do that <laughs> that is thing. and i feel like pete's gonna get mad at me for saying this that's a bad scene like and actively everybody is terrible in that scene yeah. it's oh like you think just... you think benicio del toro is bad you think he's not worth being in the movie i think he's a great actor and he's a lot of fun at guardians of the galaxy he is very weird there in a way that back, I, I remember very specifically, like seeing that end scene, knowing what the MCU was like, I loved it at that point because I was like, oh man, this is super weird. I can't wait to add some weirdness into the MCU. Now that we've seen a lot of weirdness and we've seen what we're just like, looking back at it, that's too weird, I think. Don't, like, don't it's... put that on him. That or if, if the collector like it was weird. is a cool nerdy thing to have at the end well, of a fucking the, movie. I would be shocked if what is it, Jamie Alexander and Ray Stevenson, who are playing Volstag and Sift, if they had any idea what they were talking about. They were like, put on yeah. these costumes, come here, we're gonna feed some lines into your earpiece, just say these things. We're gonna film this in twenty minutes. Like, yeah. Hey, hey, Zalbin, listen. You're not a line producer. You don't know how movies work, all right? So stop acting like you do. Well, Justin is a line producer, so is this how movies work? Again, not a line producer, and that is not... The line producer is not there (laughs) for a lot of the (laughs) acting choices. They're the one Um, that yells action behind the camera, right? That's right, yes. Mm. Famously, that's the line they're producing, um, is Mm. action. Nice. They produce the line. (laughs) They say it. That's great. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um... Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And I think it that end, that end credit scene points to sort of the larger, like, self-seriousness with which this movie, like, it takes itself too seriously. And that last scene is, like, so weird and, like, formal. When if the It's collector not was just, technically like, the last scene. The, we get a kiss scene after that. Well, I want to talk about that scene in a second. Uh, by the way, it's also weird because that was directed by James Gunn. And you, as usual, they filmed this on the set of Guardians of the Galaxy and then looped yeah. back. But I agree with you. It's very stiff, very formal. Then we do get that last scene, which I love. I actually think that is a great end credit scene. It's crazy that that's not in the movie proper and you have to sit through all the credits with that. But it's such a good kiss with Natalie Portman. Right, Pete? It is. This is a trap, by the way, so get ready. But Natalie Portman and Chris Hemsworth are so good in that scene. Right, Pete? I... <laughs> Uh-oh. It's not Natalie Portman, Pete. That's not Natalie Portman to that scene. The reason the kiss is so good, it's actually Chris Hemsworth, real life wife, Elsa Pataki, who's in that scene in a Natalie Portman costume because they couldn't get Natalie Portman back for the shoot. And that's why the kiss is so passionate in that scene. Isn't that crazy? You, that you pr- is crazy. You proud of yourself for setting me up like that? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Well, uh, I'm sure Natalie would have done just as good as a job. Listen, man, I'm a real asshole guard. I don't know what to say. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) Uh, Other thoughts about this movie? Any other things that you guys want to shout out or call out? Uh, Jane Foster slapping people was very enjoyable. I could have used a little bit more of that. I thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, the I really liked. I mean, this is back on the Loki thing, but I love that scene where they're walking through the hallway and Loki is changing into various other people. Yeah, his yes, Chris Hemsworth was, was Chris Evans. Chris well, Evans. So yeah. I, I know I've shouted these out. Great a bunch impression. Of times, but there is a deleted scene, and you can check it out on Disney Plus, where 
They didn't get Chris Evans. I don't know what the backstory is. I don't know if they shot it, weren't sure if they could get Chris Evans in the movie or something and maybe came back and did it later. But it's Tom Hiddleston in the Captain America uniform doing the same lines. And because Tom Hiddleston in real life is an amazing mimic, yeah, he, is. he does this perfect Chris Evans voice. And it's so funny. Wow, man, that is cool. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with you on the Darcy stuff. I think, like, that's the humor that pops the most of the movie. She is a lot of fun. I think the portal stuff is fun, and it pays off nicely by the end, but I wish there was, like, a little bit more of it. Um, but overall, Pete, any other... Oh, there was one other thing that I wanted to call out that's a real weird bummer. Not that he gets a lot to do anyway, but Hogan just getting kind of dismissed at the beginning of the movie is strange. Mm. Well, he gets a call back at the end um, there, but like, sure. uh, I thought it was a super cool gesture for, you know, as far as him becoming King and like, he was like, this is your home. Go be with your people. You've done enough. I thought that was like a cool moment to let somebody like, Hey, you don't have to serve anymore. You've done hey, your time. We already have enough warriors in this movie. We don't need you. Sif is going to fill your well, role in the montage. Obviously sequence they could use more warriors, but it's like he didn't know that. And he was trying to be nice to somebody. I thought sure. it was a cool thing. I don't know. It's weird. But uh, I love Sif. And we get mm -hmm. at least a little bit more Sif in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the most Sif. This is a peak I Sif, so. right? Yeah, She's yeah. not even in thor ragnarok but we'll talk about something else in a second with her um what what else any other scenes for the movie before we move to our final section here well uh, the stan lee cameo sure oh, maybe you know. i mean it's fitting that the worst cameo is in the worst movie Ah, uh, i thought it was fun he wanted to sh get his shoe back Yes, I mean, his two famous catchphrases are uh, Excelsior and um, Can I Get My Shoe Back? A lot yeah. of shoe jokes in this movie. There's that yeah. joke later on when Thor and Jane are uh, leaving the portal area in the dark world, and they're like, and I think he says, why are there so many shoes here? Which is a very funny line. Yeah, and how yeah. about the finding of the keys? That was huge. You know, that was a fun, they, you know, they cat. Right in the car. Kat set that up early, like, were those our keys? That was a great, funny line. Mm -hmm. And then she finds the keys. Uh, I mean, that was just... But I did really like the setup of kind of like Thor and Loki and the getting used to each other and the kind of like, we don't get the go for help, but they team up and uh, kind of like trick uh, the Dark Elves. And I think that's such a fun like precursor to get help, that them kind of finding a way to kind of work together. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. No, I appreciate your thoughts, Pete. I just don't necessarily have anything to add. I feel like well, th this that's the main thing about this movie, right? Is like, it's fine. There's some nice things. There's some bad things, but it's just also very yeah. middle of the road. Uh, Mjolnir was working so hard in this movie, mm -hmm. chasing Thor all over the place, and he's getting zapped around. You had to feel bad Again, for the hammer. That's good. Like, Mjolnir going around the cosmos as they fall through portals is exactly what should happen at the end of the movie, and I think they... Yeah deliver on that very well but what follows it again is just kind of eh, where he's like i can walk through a cloud yeah it's amazing that mjolnir takes corporals and it's just like let me respect the traffic yeah uh, exactly signals, really just <laughs> i could go through stuff. this building uh but i won't yeah. yes and of course the biggest thing about this episode is it really tied into that episode of agents of shield that also i believe uh, featured sif where the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. investigate the very same building, the very same library or wherever it was, and kind of look at some wreckage and then some stuff goes wrong. And that, that's the most sif that happens. She's actually in that episode. It actually does things. That's amazing they were able to tie in the best show with the best Marvel movie. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised after this movie it wasn't more about that monster that just has to be chasing seagulls around, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, Alex, Seagulls? you asked earlier what the most iconic moment of this movie, and I think it's the spaceship going into the dirt. The spaceship going through uh, through the water and then hitting mm -hmm. the dirt and still going. Yeah. When I saw the trailer, I was like, that's cool. And at the end of the movie, I was like, that was cool. But that's about it. <laughs> All right. Let's turn to our vision board then where we look forward. We've already talked about this a little bit. 
I don't think there's a lot of elements that they're going to pull off of here uh, that we're necessarily going to see going forward in the MCU. Usually, we're not going to pick uh, up on any of the no, threads. No, Dark Elves. We didn't even really talk about Curse, who's a big, great character for the Walt Simonson run of Thor, who gets very much misused here, and it's a real bummer. Um, but yeah, man, I don't know. I feel like maybe there's an opportunity with what if or something like that to do justice to the dark elves potentially or Malekith. No, sorry, buddy. They were, they, they're over. <laughs> they don't go never, back. Never reference it anyway. Uh, so the big thing that is Thor love and thunder where we are going to see Jane Foster as Thor. We're also going to see Sif again. So it does feel like versus Thor Ragnarok that went very much a field and did its own thing. It really was a world war or Planet Hulk movie with Thor stuck into it. This, to me, feels like, okay, we're looping back, we're getting back to all of the Asgard stuff that we should have been dealing with before. And uh, I don't know. I'm excited to see how it pans out. I'm excited to see what they do with it. Well, I'm curious. I'm very excited for the movie. Uh, it's a long way off, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but I do think, like Mjolnir, we're slowly calling it to us. It's just going to take the long <laughs> way. Um I'm curious how they're going to, because I think we have this new like tone for Thor mm. and the Thor movies, which are like funny. Thor is funny, um, not self serious at all. Sort of like a god who is like post god in a lot of ways. Very is even more human than a lot of the humans he interacts with. And I'm, I'm curious how that tone is going to track with Jane Foster um, and. Uh, Natalie Portman as Jane Foster, and just the tone of the whole movie in general, getting into this you know, sort of formal Shakespearean Asgard that we've set up in these first two movies. How are they going to sort of smash those two things together? Yeah. Uh, there's a quote. This was Taika Waititi, who's the director of this movie, directed Thor Ragnarok as well, directed Thor Love and Thunder, excuse me, uh, said, um, I've done some crazy shit in my life. I've lived like 10 lifetimes, but it's the craziest film I've ever done. If you wrote down all the elements of the film, it shouldn't make sense. It's almost like it shouldn't be made. If you walked into a room and said, I want this and this and this, who's in it? These people, what are you going to call it? Love and Thunder. I mean, you never work again. Maybe I won't after this, which I think points to what we're talking about because it's got Jane Jane Foster turning into a Thor. You've got Sif coming back. You've got, it looks like Thor is dressed up as Thunderstrike from the 90s or 2000s comics. You've got Guardians of the Galaxy are in it. There's so many things going on. Plus you've got uh, Christian Bale as Gore the God Butcher, which is this very serious, very intense storyline from Jason Love Aaron. It. You've got Russell Crowe playing Zeus. So many things happening. Um and the, Throg, yeah. an alligator Loki. Potentially. Maybe they yeah. tie in. Maybe there's going to be Loki as well. I don't know. But I don't know. I'm excited. Again, like they went away from it in the last Thor movie. I'd be kind of excited if they loop back to some of the emotional stuff from the first two Thor movies for this last one. I think this would be good. Here's my very uh, from the hip prediction for those. I feel like we won't see much or any of Loki. It feels like Loki has sort of exited Aww. the Thor world and I think that's fine there's st too much going on in the this movie that based on what Alex just said I bet Thor will um have become unworthy before the movie even starts mm. I th feel like our Thor may not pick up um Mjolnir at all in Love and Thunder well it wasn't it it was destroyed in the last movie and right, he got right, right. whatever it's called Jarn Bjorn or anything the yeah. axe Yarn, so. Yarn Bjorn Yarn Bjorn uh, uh, I, but I, I'm just saying, I don't think Chris Hemsworth will, will pick up the mm -hmm. hammer. He's going to, and I feel like he might play, be played completely for comedic, uh, the comedic side of it, where he is Thunderstrike being this like sort of vigilante, maybe like very much front of camera vigilante, like I'm on the street fighting for you. Uh, I'm Thunderstrike, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. I think that would be fun. Pete, yeah, one element we don't know about, oh, I, I, Pete, do you think Darcy is going to come back? Yes, 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question. And what Chris O'Dowd? Ian? Oh, Ian? Will Ian be back? Uh, I don't, who cares After about? his settlement from his wow. uh, oh, sexual on, harassment suit? And, and Pete, do you hate Ian because you wish you were Ian? Kissing, <laughs> no. kissing those no. Do you lives? hate Andrew WK because you wish you were Andrew WK in real life who is romancing Cat <laughs> oh Dennings? Don't put real stuff into stuff, bro. They're engaged. 
That's great you gotta for stop, them, Pete. Yeah, you got to stop I, writing them. I'm not, what are their? What is? I mean, we've had Andrew WK on the show a couple of times back in the no. day. Like they, they must have a wild, wild conversations all the time, <laughs> all the time. And I think they go a little something like this. Yeah, party, 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 <laughs> party, 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 meow, meow, party, meow, 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 party. That's how they talk, I think. All right, folks, I think we're going to wrap up this episode and talk about, again, everybody's favorite movie, Thor The Dark World. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about the MCU. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Marvel Vision Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and more. Until next time, Stay marvelous. You dare speak to me as some pancake flattened and flipped in a pan and then slathered in a goopy little syrup? How dare you? I am to be buttered. <laughs>